Willie Fisher was receiving messages from Moscow Center. He was sending messages to Moscow Center. He was clearing up messes. He was keeping the show on the road. And he was paying people. He was certainly paying Kim Philby, for example, more than once. This is Cold War Conversations. If you're new here, you've come to the right place to listen to first-hand Cold War history accounts. Do make sure you follow us in your podcast app or join our emailing list to keep up with the latest episode. On the 10th of February 1962, Gary Powers, the American pilot whose U-2 spy plane was shot down in Soviet airspace, was released on the Bridge of Spies in Berlin. His captors exchanged him for one Colonel Rudolf Abel, a.k.a. William Fisher, one of the most extraordinary characters in the history of the Cold War. Born plain of William Fisher in Newcastle-upon-Tyne in the UK, this British grammar schoolboy was the child of revolutionary parents who had fled Tsarist oppression in Russia. Their son returned to his spiritual homeland, the newly formed Soviet Union, and became a spy, embarking on a mission to New York where he ran the network that stole America's atomic secrets. In 1957, Willie's luck ran out and he was arrested and sentenced to 30 years in prison. Five years later, the Soviet Union's regard for his talents was proven when they insisted on swapping him for Gary Powers. I speak with Vin Arthi, the author of Abel, the true story of the spy they traded for Gary Powers. Vin has traced Willie's tale from the most unlikely beginnings in Newcastle to Moscow, the streets of New York and back again. It's a story of Cold War espionage to rival anything in fiction. Now, Cold War history is disappearing, but a simple monthly donation will help keep this podcast on the air. You'll be part of our community, you'll get a sought-after Cold War Conversations coaster as a thank you, and you'll bask in the warm glow of knowing that you're helping to preserve Cold War history. If a monthly contribution is not your cup of tea, we also welcome one-off donations via coldwarconversations.com slash donate. I'm delighted to welcome Vin Arthi to our Cold War conversation. Rudolf Abel was not the spy's real name. Spies don't use their real names at all, of course. But the man we all know, including the Soviets and including the Russians, as Rudolf Ivanovich Abel, or Abel, as the Russians pronounce it, was born in the United Kingdom, in England, on the July the 11th, 1903, and he's he was registered at birth as William August Fisher. And his father's name was Heinrich Fischer. And he was Heinrich was an ethnic German who had escaped uh, Tsarism because he was a Leninist. He knew Lenin well. Uh, and he was threatened with exiles and exile to Germany as an ethnic German. So with a friend, he got out of Russia at the very, very beginning of the 20th century. He, as I said, was very close to Lenin. He was brought, born and brought up uh, outside, well outside of, of Moscow. He was adopted as a child. His uh, natural parents had a huge number of children, uh, into the teens, I think. And the father, who was effectively a, a farm manager and a, uh, a part-time vet, decided that this particular son, Heinrich, have a better upbringing if he was adopted. And he was adopted or fostered by another German family who had no children. And the boy was given a good education, a good uh, training, and was went to St. Petersburg, and as an apprentice engineer, he worked a lot in factories. He was articulate, he was well-educated, he was an intellectual, although he never admitted that, because, of course, it was a bad thing to be in the Soviet era and amongst the Bolsheviks. But he was very bright, very intelligent, very articulate. And he worked with Marxist thinkers in St. Petersburg, became close to Lenin, and was actually 
arrested in a raid at one point, jailed for a very short time, sent on internal exile to the north of Russia, then sent in exile again to uh, further east in Russia, to Saratov, where he married. He, married a, he was an engineer, married a, a, a young midwife, as it happened. But then he was threatened by the authorities with exile into Germany, where he was going to be uh, put into the army. He would have to do military service. So he and uh, a friend, who had a young, another young engineer, who'd spent time in the northeast of England, said, we'll go to the northeast of England. So they crossed Russia and arrived in the northeast of England uh, in 1902. The young uh, wife, Lyubov, Lyubov Fisher, uh, was pregnant, and her first child, Henry Heinrich Jr., was born in the northeast of England, in Newcastle upon Tyne, in 1902, and her second son, William, was born a year later. So it was the threat of exile that brought old man Fisher, if you like, to the northeast of England. Did Heinrich have a job when he came over here? When the Fishers arrived, it's quite remarkable. Think about it. The Industrial Revolution effectively begins in the north of England with uh, iron ore, coal, heavy engineering, and, of course, in newcastle Pontine shipbuilding. And Fisher would have arrived in, uh, in an area which was, if you like, um, a crucible, had been the crucible of the Industrial Revolution. He could see the class system. It was text textbook for uh, a Marxist thinker. But old man Fisher was, uh, he was canny and money was important. He got work, I think, as a, to start with as a hod carrier where middle class housing or working class housing was beginning to be established. Uh, workers were, were coming to the city. So he got work very quickly and he was he was interested in money, fascinating, and he gradually worked his way up and got an increased income. He always rented property, they never bought, it wasn't a, a home-owning democracy, but they, they were living in better and better homes, and he eventually uh, became an engineer at um, Armstrong's, the armaments manufacturer on, uh, on the River Tyne. So he was always working his way up. Also, always involved in politics, he joined the Newcastle Socialist Society, became very, very active, and he remained very, very supportive and linked to Lenin. So, for example, he was uh, getting copies of the Leninist journal, Iskra, the Spark, sent up from London, where it was being printed. Uh, he and his wife would iron them or put them through the, the kitchen mangle and send them to different addresses in Germany and Russia so that revolutionaries in Russia could read what Lenin was doing and thinking. And then after the 1905 revolution, he really got the northeastern working classes positively behind the Russian revolutionaries. And he was also then involved with smuggling uh, Mauser rifle and pistol cartridges to the revolutionaries in Russia. There were arrests. Old man Fisher wasn't caught, but the the, implica the the evidence isn't there, but it's clear that he was very, very much involved. And one almost wonders whether he turned informer to the police to keep himself safe. But one of the things it did mean was that he couldn't na get naturalised as a British subject because of this. There were questions asked by the police and the Home Office. So a few, he, he almost immediately after that uh, uh, situation in 1907, the gun running, moved his family out to Whitley Bay on the coast at the end of the time to, to get away. And he actually applied for naturalisation again seven years later, and that time it was granted. So he became a British citizen. Did that mean that then um, Heinrich Jr. and, and Willie uh, had that citizenship, or did they have that from birth? 
Well, they will have had it from birth, if you like. They were British subjects. And in fact, uh, leaping forward, that was, of course, one of the things that his uh, uh, wife and daughter were terrified of when he was arrested uh, in the United States uh, in 1957. Because if it had been shown that he was a British subject, uh, treason uh, was 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 still um, punishable by death in in 1957, so he would have faced the death penalty if he'd been extradited to the United Kingdom. Uh, as far as Willie, um, what's he up to? He's going through the uh, the British uh, education system. I take well it? again that uh, that 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 is fascinating and important. The discussions are going back to his uh, his family, his his mother was Russian, probably Russian Jewish. His father was ethnic German and Willie and his older older brother Henry were born and brought up in the United Kingdom. They were native British. So you've already got a, a multinational and multi-ethnic family there and whether he he or the family regarded themselves as British or or Russian or German or Jewish, is part of a very interesting mix, which we have to discuss. But going back to your question, uh, the the young Henry uh, started school at the age of five, and when the young Willie, William, started school, he was allowed to be uh, with his older brother uh, in, the, in the class that his older brother was in. So they went to primary school together. Heinrich really wanted a good education for his sons. He made them work. And Henry, the firstborn, was, uh, got a grammar school place when he was 11, 12. So that would put him in 1913, 1914. But there wasn't a grammar school in Whitley Bay. The young Henry had to go to grammar school in Blythe, further north in Northumberland. But but the following year, the grammar school in Whitley Bay, Whitley Bay and Monkseaton High School, was opened in Whitley Bay. And that's where the young William started uh, grammar school, if you like, high school. And his older brother joined him in the school. As, as well. So they were grammar school boys in Whitley Bay from uh, 1914. And that had a, a, a huge uh, importance to, to them both, a good grammar school education. And inc- incidentally, my first research contact with Evelyn, William Fisher's only daughter, in the 1990s, She spoke good English and I was on the telephone to her and I asked, we didn't, I was still researching, I didn't know where the boys had gone to school. And I said to her, where did your father go to school? And she said, he went to grammar school, just like a woman of that age and that generation would have said of of a brother or a son uh, who'd 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 passed that scholarship. She was so proud of it, and clearly he was proud of it too. And the education was science, uh, drawing, there was art as well, Uh, the the sort of grammar school curriculum that we would understand by the meaning of that term now. English uh, was, if you like, William Fisher's native language, but his father was, was German, his father's first language was German, his mother's first language was Russian. He had done French and Latin at school. So clearly this is a multilingual teenager and, as you can see, a very good grounding for someone who's going to go into foreign intelligence. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. How did the outbreak of World War I impact them, particularly with the German side of their family? The outbreak of World War I was a body blow to the family. Uh, Heinrich, having a German name, he had a very, very bad time with workmates. In fact, he got a letter from the Russian consul in Newcastle-upon-Tyne at the beginning of the First World War to explain this man is not German, he is Russian. 
The family were um, the coast at, uh, on the coast at Whitley Bay. Hartlepool, just down the coast, uh, had been shelled by the German Navy very early on in the First World War. People were killed, and Whitley Bay itself wa- uh, did, w- was bombed uh, during the First World War. Then there were, as the war went on, German prisoners of war were kept uh, on the greensward uh, on the seafront. So it had a terrific impact, uh, particularly on Heinrich. But with his friend Vladimir Ilyich coming to power in in uh, Russia, how did that affect things? The Russian Revolution happens in 1917, you can argue, as a result of the First World War. Heinrich's old comrade is, is called back to Russia. He sets up um, a provisional government uh, after um, uh, Kerensky. And this is the beginning of uh, the Fishers seeing that there might be a future back for them in the, the new, the, the emerging Soviet Union. But certainly in the first two or three years after the revolution, Heinrich and the two sons were involved in the socialist and the really left-wing socialist movements in the UK. They weren't pro-trade unionist, they were pro-politics. They saw trade unionism, workers' rights, as a deviation from the real, pure, Marxist, theoretical view of the world. And they certainly uh, agitated with um, Russian crews during the First World War. Remember, we were on the same side with the Russians during the First World War. So they agitated. They certainly agitated in the streets, distributing left-wing literature. So they are very supportive of the revolution. But... As I've already said, uh, Fisher, old man Fisher was having a tough time because of his German ethnicity. And then when the war ended, there were uh, industrial disputes. He was on strike for a lot of, a lot of the time. Because of his uh, German ethnicity, he was often kicked out of work and was seeking work in various... He, he became an engineer, for example, at, a, at a, a coal mine at one point. He also wanted a good further education, higher education for his sons. And because of their financial situation, that was becoming more and more difficult. But both boys did matriculate for university, but they couldn't afford to go to university. The um, uh, Willie Fisher uh, actually went to work uh, in a draftsman's office at the shipyard. His father did what fathers did, got him a job in the yard and he worked as a draftsman at um, Swan Hunter's Yard. But he um, studied part-time, evening classes, to matriculate for university. And when it looked as though the Soviet Union, the civil war was still going on, but it looked as though the Reds were going to triumph, Heinrich took the family to Russia in 1921. So father, mother, and the two teenage boys went to Russia. Father and mother were returning home, but the two boys were going to uh, a new land. And that must have been a a strange experience for them. It's interesting to know whether they thought of that as their home or whether they thought that UK was their home. I guess we don't know. Well, there are things to say here. Um, This part of the history, if you like, is very, very difficult to get into. But the most important source for my research about Willie Fisher was his daughter, Evelyn. And I did once ask her uh, that question. I said, did your father like his time in the United Kingdom? Because he also came back to the UK as a spy in the 1930s. Uh, But, of course, the North East England was his home. He, He was born and brought up here. He was, uh, what, 17, the first 17 years of his life. I said, did your father like his time in the UK, in England? And she paused and she said, I never asked him because I didn't want him to have to tell me a lie. But I think he did. That's a really, really interesting uh, 
answer to that question. And tells you so much about Soviet society. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So with the return to, to Russia, presumably because Heinrich was a uh, a good buddy of, of Lenin, they, um, they're looked after, are they? Heinrich, I think, was expecting a senior position in Lenin's government. It didn't happen. He got a job with the Comintern, but it was an office job. It was bureaucracy. It was looking after communist developments in the English-speaking world. And it didn't really suit him. He was a worker. He wanted to be working in industry, in a factory. And being a bureaucrat just did not suit him. That was the first thing. The second thing is, one of the guys who had been tied up, a Latvian called Nagel, who had been tied up in the gun running in Newcastle-upon-Tyne, in fact, in the north of England and Scotland in the uh, in 1907, was arrested and shot in the very, very early 1920s. And, of course, he had been associated with Heinrich Fischer. They knew each other. We don't know whether Fisher had informed on him, for example. We, we simply don't know. But it's absolutely clear that F old man Fisher was also vulnerable because of that. So he went back into industry and became manager of, of a factory in Vologda, north of Moscow. And so he moved out of mainstream politics, remained a member of the Bolshevik Party, who was an old Bolshevik, of course, an original uh, Bolshevik Party member, and he wrote memoirs uh, about uh, his his time in, the, in in England, his time as a, as a revolutionary in Russia, as a Bolshevik, two volumes of memoirs, but he moved out of the political field. Going back to the two boys for a moment, they were quite special. They were the teenage sons of an, of an old Bolshevik. When they first arrived in, in, back in Moscow, they had... Um, they had accommodation in the in the Kremlin for the first few weeks, and eventually moved into a um, a, a tenement block outside of of the Kremlin, but still in Moscow. And the two boys, as if you like, the teenagers, the sons of an important Bolshevik, were very much involved in the Komsomol as young leaders in the uh, Soviet youth organization, the communist youth organization. They went on a summer camp. And the older boy, Henry, Henry Jr., was killed. He drowned in a drowning accident when they were on this, um, this camp with the youngsters, which devastated the family. The mother, Lyubov, uh, never recovered. And it's arguable that Willie never recovered either. Willie is now in his teenage years or is it early 20s now? They get to Moscow when Willie is 17 I say months after this um, tragedy with the older brother, that he he's called up into the Red Army. And that is a significant period in his life. He's a radio operator in the Red Army, uh, makes, has comrades, and this, this is a very important period for him. But just pausing there for a moment, the Soviet histories of Willie Fisher, uh, the man who they know have continued to call Abel or Abel, uh, is that he learnt it all as a schoolboy in Moscow and as a radio operator in the Red Army. This is not true. His interest in radio begins as a boy in Whitley Bay on the Northumberland coast. The ship-to-shore radio mast was just a few hundred yards from the Fisher homes. And the schoolboys, of course, made crystal sets and listened in. Radio was very exciting for them. It was very, very new. And that's where he began his interest in radio. It was natural that he would... Um, get into radio work when he joined the army because radio technology was developing and he became very close to a number of senior 
radio people. One of them, Ernst Krenkel, another Russo-German who was involved in Arctic uh, radio rescues and uh, activities uh, in the 1930s and indeed 40s. So joining the Red Army was very, very important. The second area of importance for Willie Fisher was he had comrades and a group of these young soldiers went to a party where Willie Fisher met the sister of one of the comrades and that was Yelena and eventually the two fell in love and married. Is it in the the Red Army that the the KGB sort of see some talent in him? Going back to um, Willie Fisher's love life, if you like, uh, he meets Yelena and they spend time together. She is, in fact, Yelena uh, began um, at the Bolshoi Ballet but fell awkwardly um, as a young dancer and had to give up ballet and went into music and she uh, went to the conservatoire. Music was very, very important for the Fisher family. Uh, Old man Fisher could play the accordion. Um, They loved classical music. uh, So music was an important part of their lives when they were children. And uh, Willie encouraged Yelena with her, um, her music, her piano, Um, and her harp so that was part of the if you like their courtship was around music and Yelena playing when they got married I don't know what what Yelena's father said you know will you keep my daughter in the manner to which she's become accustomed but uh, Fisher was certainly thinking I've got to get a proper job now I've really got to work Um, And Yelena's family suggested that the security services might be uh, a very good place to get a job because um, they would need linguists. They would need people to interpret and translate. So that's what took Willie Fisher into the Cheka, the Ogpu, if you like, the beginnings of the KGB. It was uh, he got to get a job. And that seemed the perfect fit. What's Willie's first role then in the uh, intelligence services? He goes into training and in, in, in the intelligence services and he, he has to do everything. Again, if you look at his CV at that time, he has to talk about things like how they were on the lookout for Trotskyists, how they were on the lookout for priests who were hiding money, uh, those sorts of things. We don't know to what extent those were invented, but he he went into training. So he was in training for a period, and then he began to specialise in radio work and began to... In fact, he was... um, uh, he was involved even at the very beginning of his, his career with uh, the OGPU NKVD, was involved in training spies who were going overseas in radio work. So that happened very, very early. When is he seen as a potential overseas agent? So he gets, uh, he gets married in the late 1920s. Uh, he becomes a father uh, in 1927 or 28. So he's a married man with uh, a small child. He speaks English. In fact, English is his native language, if you like. He's a good radio operator. So he is a good person to send abroad. He's got good cover, excellent cover. So uh, in the very late 1920s, he's sent to... Norway to Oslo where his job is to set up radio receiving and transmitting points in and around Oslo. You can see that he links up with sympathisers, left-wing socialists, trade unionists, uh, communist party members and his friends, his family friends at that time are fellow socialists his cover is as uh, he's got a a small shop selling 
um, electrical equipment, particularly radio equipment. And Yelena, his wife, sets up a dancing school, uh, dancing classes. And the young Evelyn uh, is a young dancer. So there are family photographs of her in a ballet tutu and so on at these dancing classes, these ballet classes in Oslo. And they're there for, what, three, four years in the very late 1920s and early 1930s. That's seen as quite a success then. He is successful at this, but there is evidence that he was suspected. Something was a bit odd about him. I I think it might have been a Norwegian army officer who noticed him in these circles and wondered how he could be making such a good living out of his tiny business. And uh, he was eventually withdrawn from, from Oslo for fear that he could be uh, found out completely. But he, he got out before that could happen. He's he's then back in the Soviet Union for a while, but he, he's sent back out for a mission in London, I think you said earlier. So he goes back to Moscow. He goes into radio training again, working at the centre, and he's involved in quite important training. He, he is involved in the training of a young Russian-Canadian-American uh, spy kitty harris who eventually marries earl browder the head of the uh, communist party of the united states and kitty harris is trained and uh, as a radio operator and uh, an illegal spy willie fisher is her radio training tutor so he's working in training he also becomes friendly with the real rudolf abel at this time and in fact going back to one of my sources, uh, the late Kirill Henkin, who knew both these men, he said that uh, they were so close and that they they both did radio that they were rather like a, a music hall joke, a sort of the Morecambe and Wise, if you like, of um, of the NKVD. And the, sometimes the senior officers would mistake one for the other. They'd call Fisher Abel and Abel Fisher. And they sometimes referred to both of them as Fisher Abel because they were so close. So that, this is when um, Willie Fisher meets Rudolf Abel. And then he's sent to London for a short while. Again, he's setting up radio receiving and transmitting units and sites. And there is an argument. The ev- There is some evidence, but uh, it... I'm putting two and two together. I hope I'm making four, but it could be five. But the the Russian physicist, Piotr Kapitsa, who some would argue was the father of the Soviet atomic bomb, although there's debate about that, but he's a significant physicist. I would argue that he was more important in developing low-temperature fuel for the big Soviet rockets of the 1940s and 50s, rather than the atomic bomb itself. But Piotr Kapitsa uh, was called back to Russia for a conference. His wife and two sons remained in Cambridge, where he was a professor. It's my strong feeling that Willie Fisher was involved in getting Kapitsa's laboratory equipment and the Kapitsa wife and children back to Moscow. I think... There's strong evidence for that. But again, Fisher wasn't in London for very long because his case officer, André Deutsch, was spotted by someone. And so he was withdrawn. Deutsch was was withdrawn and Fisher was was withdrawn soon afterwards. In this period, Stalin has, has gained power. How how does Willie and the rest of the family fare in the purges? Willie Fisher's father, Heinrich, dies in 1935. He's an old Bolshevik that Stalin is is trying to wipe out the old Bolsheviks. He's using, um, if you like, uh, Lenin as the hero, but getting rid of all of those who are associated with Lenin. Heinrich Fischer dies of pneumonia in 1935 and Evelyn Fischer 
His granddaughter, Willie Fisher's daughter, said it was said that he was lucky to die when he did. If he had survived, he would have been purged. Duboff, the wife, uh, was also unwell at the time, and she was she was certainly vulnerable, but ignored. As the purges went on, Willie Fisher's position did become vulnerable. But Beria and Khrushchev began to get concerned that the security services, the NKVD, was being wiped out by these purges. Skillful, experienced officers were simply being killed. So there was a move to throw them out of the service rather than have them imprisoned or executed. And it seems that this is what happened to Willie Fisher. He turned up to work, presumably at the Lubyanka one morning, and uh, to find that he'd been sacked. So he had no work. And there is evidence that he went to Piotr Kapitsa uh, to get help in finding work. And there is evidence that Kapitsa helped him to find uh, translating work. And he also went to Andrei Andreev, a member of the Politburo, an old friend of Heinrich's. And Andreev helped him get a job in a factory. When the Great Patriotic War, when Russia goes into the Second World War in 1941, his services are needed and he's called back in. So he's called back into the uh, the NKVD. And what's his uh, war service like? Looking back, if we were to interview Willie Fisher now, I think he would say that his greatest contribution was uh, in the Second World War, in the Great Patriotic War. His radio service was absolutely vital. First of all, in 1941, Fisher was the radio operator stood next to uh, General Suda Platov, who was head of special tasks, a very, very nasty unit within the NKVD. They were in Red Square, Moscow, in the 1941 celebration of the revolution, with the German troops close to Moscow. And Willie Fisher was in touch with the Soviet front line throughout that uh, Red Square parade and event to let uh, let them know if, if the Germans were, were, were advancing. Then, and again, it was a special tasks operation led by Suda Platov and his close comrade, comrade uh, Leonid Eitingon. They ran radio deception games. And the big one was uh, Operation Monastery, where the Soviets tricked the Germans into believing that there was a massive anti-Soviet, pro-German, white Russian operation, which was a total deception. But linked to that was an even more significant uh, operation, it seems to me, uh, Operation Berezina. And when the Soviet troops started to advance through the Soviet Union into Belarusia, Belarus as it is now, they captured a German colonel and turned him. And with radio messages, got in touch with the Abwehr and the German high command, indicating that this... German officer had troops in excess of 200 with him and managed to get um, radio equipment, arms, medical equipment, personnel parachuted into this non-existent German army uh, behind the enemy lines and it was a huge success. So I think that that would Willie Fisher would regard it as, as his greatest achievement in all of his service. This is a part of his life that 
certainly I didn't know about until I read your book, because obviously most of the focus is on his um, espionage career in in the US. So uh, fascinating, fascinating stuff. So towards the end of World War II, the Great Patriotic War, the um, Soviets, they've got agents in the in the US and they're they're tracking the, the Manhattan Project. Where does Willie sort of fit into this? When when does the intelligence services think, actually, he might be a good guy for us to uh, place in the US? Well, when the when the Second World War comes to an end, remember that that. The Soviet Union is absolutely devastated. They make lots of um, catastrophic errors as well. For example, there there are suggestions that th- that they thought that they might be eligible for the Marshall Plan. These, if, if these sorts of things had been thought through and developed, um, post-war history would have been very, very different. There may never have been a Cold War but never discount Stalin. Also, never misunderstand that that the Soviet Union was absolutely devastated. So economically, and also in terms of uh, military intelligence and counterintelligence, and the development of uh, communist propaganda, if you like, things were a mess. Things um, were, were, were held up. So really, for two or three years after the end of the Second World War, Willie Fisher is is kicking his heels, and there are power struggles with what is still the NKVD. It hasn't become the KGB yet. What to do with people? Uh, there were there were thoughts about him coming back into Western Europe as uh, a radio link man, but. Finally, it was Leonid Eitingon, um, uh, Pavel Sudoplatov's um, close comrade, who suggested that it would be good to send Fisher to the United States to try and revive the spy rings that had really um, fallen away to nothing, leaving aside the uh, the group, the tiny group that was getting the. Um, the atomic secrets um, the, out of the Manhattan Project, but there were spies and spy rings throughout the United States and in Canada and in South America that um, were sort of moribund because of the war, and they needed someone to to reorganise that. So Fisher was sent back in 1947 to do that job to revive the moribund spy rings in the United States. Is he trained for that or do they, do we have any indication as to how he, he's prepared for that? These things are the deepest secrets, how you train your uh, intelligence officers uh, and the techniques they're going to use are the deepest secrets. But he would certainly have gone through uh, training for this and of course he he was a native english speaker and certainly we know from his time in the united states that we've never ha- heard him speaking english and i suspect he must have had uh, the vestiges of a geordie accent but of course the united states uh, and certainly at that time was full of people who got a range of accents when they spoke English. So that wasn't necessarily a huge problem for him. He had a series of complex legends, so he travelled to across to the United States from Scandinavia into Canada, down through Canada into the United States, uh, with papers for him under the name of Andrew Coyotes, he then exchanged them through the NKVD resident, Grigulevich, uh, into the papers for Emil Goldfuss. And that was the name he went by uh, when he was based in um, in New York. So he was trained for um, cr- in the creation and management of, of legends 
these alternative um, personalities and life histories. Uh, he was a radio man, and that was um, the key thing. He was going to be receiving and sending messages uh, back to the centre all the time. Uh, so clearly he did have a long period of training preparing him for that, but the details we don't know. Because I was interested to see he he was he saw Molotov, the uh, the Soviet foreign minister, before he he went. He, he, yes, he was he was sent off. Uh, he met, yes, he met Molotov, um, and was, because it was it was clearly a, a, a very important um, posting, and he was going to be an important man. And it is important to say that uh, every foreign embassy uh, across the world has um, intelligence personnel in it, um, foreign intelligence people. And the host country knows that there are going to be uh, foreign intelligence people in those embassies. And these people are declared. Willie Fisher was sent to the United States as an illegal with no diplomatic cover at all. If he was discovered, he'd be on his own. Um, Good night, Vienna. So it was a very special assignment, and he was a very special person. And the revival of these um, Soviet spy rings, particularly the illegals in the United States, was of huge significance. So yes... um, he, uh, I think he had dinner with uh, Molotov before he went, and the nasty man um, Abakumov uh, was hiding in the shadows when um, when Willie Fisher uh, set off uh, by train into Scandinavia uh, to get the boat to go across to the United States. So yes, it um, he was highly regarded, and it was a significant moment in Soviet uh, yeah, espionage. Yeah, it's interesting reading that he came in from Canada because uh, I interviewed Jack Barsky, who was a, a KGB spy of the, the 1980s, and that's exactly the same route um, he came through. So it's probably just a tried and trusted way of of getting in and uh, perhaps avoiding uh, surveillance that way. Um, what is his his mission there so he's 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 there to reactivate these intelligence um networks but what what is his cover what what is he you know supposed to be uh doing to just uh you know hide this role well his um his cover is as a re- a retired the american term is a photo finisher uh that's the job do you remember when we used to take photographs and take them into the chemists to be developed and printed? The photo finisher would be the guy in a chemist shop developing and printing your photographs. He basically had a, a, a small business had a, as a photo finisher, developing and updating photo finishing equipment. So that was his cover. And he did what he had done in Oslo, certainly, that he moved in uh, free-thinking circles. Now, the Communist Party of the United States was never very big, and the men he moved amongst were, you know, if you like, young uh, United States Army veterans, uh, but they were th- free-thinkers, and they were artists, and he he was also a painter. Uh, we haven't mentioned this, Ian, but um, he was always interested in art. He drew and painted from when he was a child, and Whitley Bay colour coats that corner of the north northeast of England is uh, attracts artists. In fact, the American artist Winslow Homer in the late 19th century spent time uh, living and painting in colour coats. And um, I made a point of looking, researching uh, where Winslow Homer's North East England paintings and drawings are, which galleries they're available in in the United States. And I can't prove it, but I'm convinced that uh, Willie Fisher went to see those pictures because those were paintings of where he was from. 
and he made he made to, he made paintings and similar paintings and drawings of his own. In fact, one of the artists, uh, Bert Silverman, who I talked to about that, I mentioned Winslow Homer, and Bert Silverman said, "Yes, that's just the sort of work he would have liked. Liked just the sort of work he would have liked." So his cover was as a photo finisher, but also as an artist moving among free thinking artists. I've uh, chatted with uh, Bert Silverman, and uh, that was fascinating. Um, particularly the because uh, he showed me a couple of portraits I'd not seen before that he'd painted of of Willie, and uh, Bert Silverman's probably he, his his fame in this story is the painting of willie next to the uh receiver that he was receiving his messages from moscow on what sort of intelligence is willie's networks pa- passing on to the u.s because i've i've not been clear as to how how effective he was well take a step back this is a question ian that is asked a lot a number of soviet spies at the time kgb men said they resented him not all of them he was much loved but some of them resented him saying look he was over there in the united states the implication being enjoying that life which we didn't enjoy painting his pictures what was he doing when he was arrested Uh, They found radio equipment, spy paraphernalia. They found money, but they couldn't find exactly what he was doing. Now, I've got some research on this uh, and researching espionage. There is guesswork. What is intelligence? Intelligence is information on which you can act. It is not evidence because evidence is information that will stand up to cross-examination in a court of law. So looking at the intelligence, we do know that he was the illegal resident, that is the most senior illegal, Soviet illegal, in New York in the late 1940s and early 1950s. We do know that he was there when... Uh, the Rosenbergs were arrested, tried and executed. The story of the Rosenbergs is covered in episode 184. There'll be a link in the episode notes. We do know that he got the Coens, Morris and Lona. He got them out through Mexico. He warned them. They left through Mexico and they went, uh, they did some espionage work um, in Australia and New Zealand before they arrived in the UK and were uh, key members of the Portland Spy Ring in the 1960s. We know all about that. Willie Fisher got them out. The story of the Portland Spy Ring is covered in episode 138 and episode 139. There'll be links in the episode notes. Theodore Hall, the young physicist who had been giving American intelligence on the bomb to the Russians in the mid-1940s, wanted to give up completely. He wanted to stop doing it. And Willie Fisher had meetings with him and managed to keep him on site. He couldn't get him to continue espionage. But he did stop him going to the authorities. And Theodore Hall eventually came as a physicist, a university lecturer to the United Kingdom and lived out his years, dying in 1999, without his role in the Manhattan Project, getting uh, the secrets out to the Soviet Union ever having been revealed. So um, what was Willie Fisher doing? He was resident. He was clearing up a lot of mess. He was keeping people on side. Remember, too, that Stalin is ailing and then dies. Um, and you could say that between 1953 and uh, his arrest in um, 1957, Fisher was rather like one of those Japanese soldiers who was on an island and never gave up um, uh, after the end of the Second World War. They just kept there 
living the life they were supposed to be living and doing the work they were supposed to be. That's an overstatement, but uh, not too much of an overstatement, I don't think. So he was keeping the show on the road and he was uh, also paying people who were working for the Soviet Union. So, so he was in New York rather than Washington. Uh, and of course, a lot, particularly of third world countries, had their, their senior, they had diplomats uh, at the United Nations. They couldn't send them all over the world. They didn't have enough. So uh, having agents, diplomats in the United Nations uh, was very, very useful for the Soviets. So uh, Willie Fisher was receiving messages from Moscow Centre. He was sending messages to Moscow Centre. He was clearing up messes. He was keeping the show on the road and he was paying people. He was certainly paying uh, uh, Kim Philby, for example, more than once. I once met Anthony Palermo. Uh, Anthony's in his, he, he's in his 90s now. The last surviving lawyer uh, who was at the Willie Fisher trial. He was a, a young lawyer on the prosecution bench. And discussing with him, and he asked me the same question. He said, Vin, what was Fisher actually doing? And I said, well, I think he was an administrator. And Palermo's jaw dropped. He said, yes, yes, that's what it was. So I think that was his role. You mentioned there that he paid Philby's. Presumably that was when Philby was working in the US. Yes. Wow. What a been a fly on the wall for that meat. <laughs> well, well, he he may never have spoken to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dead, dead drop. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Uh, I should also say that, uh, and again, this is um, uh, Willie Fisher's da daughter speaking to me. He loathed Philby. He did not. He called Philby the traitor. And he also, uh, Philby was, uh, was an alcoholic, drank a lot, and Willie Fisher was not. He loathed alcohol alcoholics. Uh, but in it is interesting calling him the traitor. Um, what uh, Fisher's, uh, Fisher's life in many ways was a tragic life. Uh, did he himself feel a traitor? Did he himself feel a traitor to his homeland? Uh, he was um, a communist through and through, uh, and he survived. He didn't die in his own bed, uh, but he died a natural death. Uh, but how did he feel about what he'd done and what he had to do? Mm, interesting, interesting questions. How is he caught? He made a mistake. In the mid-1950s, he was sent an assistant. The workload was horrendous. And he was sent this assistant, Rhino Heihanen. And Heihanen was an alcoholic. He was a wife beater, a nasty piece of work. He arrived uh, and Fisher realised that he'd got a massive problem on his hands. Heihanen was inadequately trained. Again, you know, the, if you like, the old system falling apart. He was missing dead drops, he was losing material, and Fisher was complaining about him to the centre, really from the moment he arrived. Finally, Heihanen was recalled to Moscow Centre, this is in 1957, and on his way back to Moscow, he breaks his journey in Paris, walks into the United States Embassy, and defects. He's debriefed and taken back to New York and he's asked about his boss, uh, who doesn't know his real name, of course. He's got a, a, a code name for him, which is, could, be, uh, could be Martin, it could be Mark, but a mistake Fisher made was on one occasion taking Hey Hainan to the art studios in Brooklyn to give him some material. So Hey Hainan knew about the art studio. Now, it took a time, a while for the FBI 
to find out where these studios were because Heihainen was certainly not reliable. Uh, but finally, they searched, uh, interviewed all of the artists there. From there, they got details of the, of the hotel that Fisher was in. I should say, before this, um, Fisher knew that the game was up and was travelling elsewhere in the United States. But he went back to New York because he had got two large sums of money, thousands of dollars, in his hotel room and in a safe deposit box in a bank. There, were, there was a, uh, a route for him to get out of the United States into Canada, but he went back to get the money before he got out. And the reason was, if he did get out and hadn't got the money, he would have been suspected of stealing it and would have been executed. So he went back to... He, he, his mistakes were, one, having shown Hay Hainan where the uh, art studios were, and, and through the art studios, the FBI found out the hotel room that Fisher was in, and two, going back to that hotel room to get the money. So those are the two big mistakes, and that's how Fisher was caught. So it's the FBI who's arresting him, is it? <laughs> yes. He's arrested by the FBI, um, but it's uh, the immigration authorities who... Because uh, they then get him because he's, a, he's arrived in the United States illegally. So uh, if you like, it's a double act. He's actually taken away to um, the alien centre in McAllen in Tax, Texas, which is where, if you like, the Mexican immigrants... Uh, Illegal immigrants are taken now, uh, some of them. So uh, it was a double act. But then, um, of course, he's, uh, he's tried for espionage and the, um, uh, the illegal immigration um, falls by the wayside. How does he come by this name of Abel? Is this the, the name that he gives the US and he's been prepared for this for some time, for this, for this moment? This, of course, is where the name... Rudolf Ivanovich Abel comes from. He's arrested and says nothing. And he's taken to McAllen in Texas. And finally, he says that his real name is Rudolf Ivanovich Abel, Abel. And he uses that as a signal to the centre, going back to Abel Fisher, Fisher Abel, it's a signal to the centre that it's Willie Fisher that's been caught. And there is evidence that when he went back on leave, Heihainen, it was before Heihainen had been recalled, um, Fisher went back and had a period of leave in uh, the Soviet Union and actually discussed with the centre that if he were to be caught, what would he do? And it was agreed that he would use the name Abel it would A, be a signal, and B, he knew Rudolf's name, background, history, habits, family, everything, almost as well as he knew his own. So it was the signal. Clever, clever. So his defence lawyer is Jim Donovan, and anybody who's ever watched Bridge of Spies will be familiar with this part of the story. So what what is the the defence that Donovan uses to try and um, at least get a possible sentence reduced or even his release? The key point of, of Donovan's defence is it was an illegal entry and an illegal grabbing of this man's property. It was a very, very astute defence in, in, in Cold War terms because he was saying, look, our society is a democratic, justice-based society, and you are breaking United States laws in arresting this man. And he ran a very, very good defence. He also took it to the United States Supreme Court, and he lost, but only by five justices to four. So that was the, the, the basis of his defence. And there's no doubt, you mentioned the, um, the film Bridge of Spies, it's actually 
uh, based on Jim Donovan's own... The screenplay, it seems to me, is based on Jim Donovan's uh, own book, Strangers on a Bridge, very, very close to it. And it's clear that both the men admired each other. They saw themselves as... They were they had similar interests. Um, they were highly intelligent men, and they were the perfect match. Of course, Donovan had worked in intelligence during the Second World War. Uh, again, a hugely impressive man. Uh, he was... Uh, Jim Donovan was on the prosecution bench uh, at the Nuremberg War Trials and was responsible for the visual evidence. So he went through all of the photographs and the moving film of the victims of uh, the concentration camps. What does that do to a man? I have tremendous admiration for Jim Donovan. Yeah, because I think he was also involved in negotiations with Castro over the, uh, the prisoners captured at the Bay of Pigs as well. That's absolutely true. It, well, in fact, the, the family is a democratic family, and Jim Donovan um, was 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 big in in the New York uh, in the Democratic Party in New York. He actually stood in uh, an election for the United States Senate for the Democrats in New York. I'm not sure the, quite the year it was in the 1960s. Uh, against Jacob Javits, the uh, the Republican senator, but uh, Javits was the sitting senator, and that that's always difficult um, a difficult task. Uh, but uh, he was he was close to Kennedy, close to the Kennedys, and Kennedy chose him to go to negotiate with Castro. And not only that, Jim Donovan took his own son John with him. Jim Donovan introduced all of his children to the work that he was doing as a lawyer. Uh, would take them to court, uh, explain to them the work he was doing, why it was important. And he took his son, um, uh, John, with him. As a beacon of trust, I trust you, he was saying to Castro. Incredible. I think John John was taken to see Abel at one point and uh, sang him <laughs> a song. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, um, again, Jim Donovan took his son, John, to visit uh, Abel in prison. And the Donovan family had in... Uh, we're talking about small kids, you know, you've seen the movie. Uh, uh, and they had this song, um, uh, Rudolf Ivanovich Abel was a very happy spy. Uh, you know, Rudolf the Red-Nosed Raider. Abel Fisher wasn't very amused. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't to his musical taste, then. No, definitely not. Oh, that's another thing um, uh, Evelyn said. Um, he he didn't like hilly billy music. He didn't like American popular music. He loved <laughs> classical music. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, what is his sentence at the trial then? Well, again, uh, credit to to Jim Donovan. Remember, the uh, the Rosenbergs have been um, have been executed just a few years before, and in in his um, speaking to the judge. Uh, it's done in an odd way in the film. But uh, Donovan says, uh, uh, when it comes to sentencing, it could have been the death penalty. Uh, but Donovan says, no, imprisonment, because there might be an opportunity sometime to exchange prisoners. And so it turned out. How does the idea come about for a spy exchange? And how long is Willie in prison before that point? He goes to prison in 57, in the autumn of 57, and he comes out in February 62. So, well, do the math, <laughs> five-ish years. And it, it, it is a bit complicated. There were and remain ambivalent feelings about Gary Powers in the United States. Why did he, how did he allow himself to be captured? Uh, how energetically was the United States trying to get this man out or help this man? But Gary Powers' family, uh, his marriage was broken, but, uh, and of course, his wife, his, uh, the wife he was going to divorce, but couldn't divorce because he was in prison, um, uh, the, the, the marriage was in difficulties, 
and the government was talking to the next of kin, i.e. his wife. But the family, uh, Gary Power's father in particular, was pressing the United States government to, and, and staying in touch with Donovan, pressing the United States government through Donovan to uh, try and do some sort of swap. So the pressure began there with Gary Power's father. During this period, is Abel in contact or is Willie in contact with his family? It's interesting, Willie Fisher's period in prison, in many ways, he could be true to himself in a way that he hadn't been since he joined the security services. He was a convicted spy. Uh, That's what he was. And he could be open about that he I could we could almost say was a model prisoner Uh, he didn't cause trouble he did a lot of artwork in prison Uh, the wardens of the two prisons um, actually used him to do their Christmas cards and their calendars prison Uh, he painted he drew he played chess with uh, with fellow prisoners, including some pretty horrific criminals. Um, but he also made contacts with Soviet spies um, who were in prison. And when he was released, got information back through into the centre. I think there was a spy called Ponga, uh, Morton Sobel, uh, the American spy. So... Um, he, 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 he remained faithful to his cause, the profession as a spy for the Soviet Union. Union. Uh, but he, prison was relaxing for him. He could be honest about everything to himself and to others. Did Evelyn give you any insight into Willie's experiences at the exchange or how he felt about the exchange? Uh, first of all, I should say that this is the one thing that I was uncomfortable about with the Spielberg film, Bridge of Spies, because um, Ellie and Evelyn, the wife and the daughter of the spy, Abel, were made out to be, well, it's almost as if they came from central casting. Uh, and the actual fact is that uh, Yelena and Evelyn, Abel's uh, Fisher's wife and his daughter, were involved, they were in Berlin for those negotiations. So it was the real wife, the real daughter, not stand-ins, the real uh, case officer, Droishtoff, who was in charge, uh, who were at those meetings. And in many ways, the the Spielberg film makes a mockery of of that aspect. So they were both there. The exchange happened at the Glenica Bridge rather than Checkpoint Charlie for two reasons, I think. One is that Checkpoint Charlie was regarded as the American crossing and the Soviets um, didn't want it there because it was the American crossing. They wanted it at the Glenica Bridge on the edge of uh, Berlin because just the other side of the Glenica Bridge in Potsdam was the KGB headquarters for the whole of Western Europe and it was a big headquarters there was a hospital there. There was a swimming pool there. There were there was a shopping mall. Um, it was it was huge, and uh, when Fisher uh, Abel got into the car and was driven into East Germany, it was just a few hundred yards into the KGB headquarters, um, and uh, in in fact, um, the the locals used to call it the Forbidden City. So Evelyn and her mother, uh, Yelena, were there. Uh, The exchange happened uh, fairly early, not in the crack of dawn, but uh, in the morning. And Yelena and Evelyn had gone shopping. So when the exchange took place, uh, the KGB officers had to run around to find them, to bring them back to to greet um, Willie when he got back. And did she describe to you at all that meeting? Evelyn didn't speak specifically about that. And it's interesting, my meetings with her, we got on well and 
we shared a lot, but I didn't want to get too deep and too prurient uh, for fear of her not talking to me anymore. So aspects of closeness of the family and marital relationships and father-daughter, I just picked up and developed. So, for example, it was clear to me that uh, Evelyn and her father were very, very close and the use of English was very, very important to them. Yelena, um, with his wife, could speak English and speak English well, but not as well as the daughter. And that was a real bond between father and daughter. Evelyn was their only child, and so the father-daughter relationship was important. Uh, she would say things about uh, relationships. For example, Willie Fisher did not know until he got back that his best friend, Rudolf, um, had uh, had died of a heart attack before he was arrested, so before he'd given the name. And so he had to live the rest of his life using the name of his friend who had died and who he felt because of that he'd betrayed. And um, Evelyn said... Uh, Daddy said that if he'd known that Uncle Rudolph had died, he would never have used his name. There is another piece, actually, that's worth saying there, and that is um, when Willie died, he was going to be buried in the Novodovichy Cemetery, the big um, cemetery in Moscow, and but he was going to be buried under Rudolph's name. And Yelena simply put her foot down he will be buried under his own name. Uh, so he was uh, cremated and, um, at the Donskoy uh, Cemetery, and that's where um, his ashes are interred, not at the Novodovichy. What was his life like in the Soviet Union when he returned? Did the KGB use him to train agents or, or anything like that? I mean, what, what did he do? Uh, Willie Fisher, when he got back, to Moscow, lived a sad and difficult life. Uh, obviously, uh, he could never be fully trusted again because it would never be known uh, what he'd given away, if anything, so he'd be tested for the rest of his life. Um, I spoke with Oleg Gordievsky, uh, the defector, and uh, Gordievsky did work with, with Fisher in the 1960s. Uh, he said, Willie... Um, he did not have a desk in the Lubyanka. He had a chair. He was consulted about uh, Western questions at times. Oleg Gordievsky would sometimes get him tickets for the ballet or for um, a symphony. They were not allowed to speak in English, although they would love to have done. Uh, they had to speak to each other in, in Russian. Uh, Willie was living under the name of his dead friend, who he thought he'd betrayed. So it was tough. He enjoyed his garden, a small dacha uh, outside of Moscow, um, and spent time there. But um, the last nine years of his life were not happy. It's a bit like Philby. They never sort of trust you when you come back. Was that part of the problem there, would you say? I say that it's, in, that it's inevitable. It's bound to happen. I guess one accepts that that will happen. He would never be trusted again. Uh, Philby's case, of course, was slightly different. Philby thought he would um, be lauded. Um, but uh, in fact, um, he was just an encumbrance to them, really. Uh, and it was only towards, gradually towards the end of his life that someone in the KGB thought, well, we better use this guy. He could be quite um, helpful in, in, in training our people about life in the West. But uh, for Willie, no, he, um, in, in, in fact, when, he, when Fisher died, he died of lung cancer and he was in a KGB hospital. His boss had uh, microphones placed around his deathbed in case he gave something away when he was dying. Don't miss the episode extras such as videos, photos and other content. Just look for the link in the podcast information. The podcast wouldn't exist without the generous support of our financial supporters and I'd like to thank one and all of them for keeping 
the podcast on the road. If you'd like to help the project, just go to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. The Cold War Conversation continues in our Facebook discussion group. Just search for Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thanks very much for listening and see you next week.